The Virginia Cable Telecommunications Association and your local cable provider presents Cable Reports. Join us now as Cable Reports brings you up to date on current issues facing the Commonwealth through discussions with your local legislators and other policymakers from across Virginia. Welcome from the General Assembly in the City of Richmond. I'm Woody Evans for Cable Reports, brought to you by the Virginia Cable Telecommunications Association and Cox Communications. We are honored today to have as a very special guest the Senate Majority Leader Tommy Norman. Welcome, sir. Good morning, Woody. It's nice to be back with you. Welcome back to Richmond. Thank you. Thank you. Well, congratulations on your re-election and also congratulations on becoming the Senate Majority Leader. Tell us about uh, your new duties and responsibilities. Well, I seem to get asked that question a lot, Woody, and I don't know if people think I was supposed to undergo some great transformation. Uh, uh, one of the newspaper reporters asked me uh, not long ago, says, well, what are you calling yourself? And I said, I'm Tommy. I was Tommy before this happened, and I'm still Tommy today, and I really don't think that I've changed too much. Um, it's not a position that I'm completely unfamiliar with. Uh, during the period of time uh, when the, the Republicans had a majority in the Senate, I ran the floor of the Senate for those four years. So I'm very comfortable in doing that. It, it's amazing. It almost uh, it makes a permanent imprint on your memory, and I just have to roll around in my mind and remember which button to push, push to what to say. So, um, but there, it's a lot of demands on my time, and really, I think the coincidence of having the opportunity to lead the Republican Senate Republican Caucus and to run the floor and coupled with being a budget conferee. Uh, there are a lot, of, a lot of new friends out there who, who want to have conversations with me. And that's probably my biggest challenge right now is, is managing the time. I've always tried to be very accessible to constituents and to members of the, the lobbying community. It's a little overwhelming right now. Um, and I'm trying my best and my staff is really working incredibly hard to accommodate people but there are just a, a lot of ask and a lot of wants out there right now. A little bit different from being chairman of uh, local board of supervisors? Slightly. <laughs> uh, you know, I only had uh, four other cats to herd, you know, in, in that venue. Uh, over here in the Senate, of course, I've got 19 other Republican senators. Uh, we all, including myself, require some, some guidance and direction on occasions. And then with the interaction of 20 Democrats, it's a... Uh, a little more challenging than on the Board of Supervisors. And of course, on the Board of Supervisors, we only met twice a month. We didn't meet every day. <laughs> well, speaking of new friends, friends, I understand as a result of redistricting, your, uh, your, your district has changed significantly. It's been a remarkable geographical process. You know, we talk a lot about redistricting, and it's always amusing to me to see the pieces of legislation that are put in and the rhetoric about nonpartisan or bipartisan redistricting, uh, how we ought to draw the districts to make them more competitive so that the voters have a real uh, alternative or options when they go to the polls. And they are the very same people who, when the redistricting process starts, are the most partisan, uh, the most protective uh, in how they draw their district to, to insulate themselves. Uh, the hypocrisy of it is just really galling. Uh, at least I'm consistent and say, hey, we've got partisan redistricting. Uh, the United States Supreme Court has said that it is acceptable to draw districts to protect incumbents. So just say it. Don't don't pretend, you know, that you're trying to be ecumenical and you know nonpartisan, and then turn around and try to draw a district that. Uh, is going to preserve uh, your place in, in state government. But having editorialized that, uh, I went from a, a district that I was very familiar with. Uh, it was compact. Uh, it shared community of interest to a very diverse district. And I like to euphemistically uh, say that uh, when the Democrats did redistricting last year, they gave me the opportunity to make a lot of new friends. Uh, and those new friends stretch almost from the North Carolina border outside of Suffolk, Virginia, uh, out to the, the fringes of, of Richmond. Uh, uh, I, no long, I, I no longer represent the city of Williamsburg. Uh, 
a car that was drawn along a particular route and created a bubble in the city of Williamsburg to take it out of the district I formerly represented. There's a fairly strong Democratic vote in the city of Williamsburg between the college community and some of the minority populations. Interestingly enough, both of those groups have always supported me. Uh, but that's particularly painful because I, I do teach at the College of William and Mary. I've tried to be the steward of that college for a number of years since my, my late and dear friend Hunter Andrews uh, retired. And he had been a great uh, steward of William and Mary and uh, with his uh, removal from the Senate, I've tried to pick up that stewardship responsibility. Also, I'm on the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation Board, uh, the first local in over 30 years and only the second local in the history of the foundation. Uh, and so to have that community sort of carved out of my backyard is mildly annoying. Um, but I picked up some new friends. Um, they moved me into uh, a couple of precincts in Suffolk, uh, part of Isle of Wight, uh, part of Smithfield, uh, one precinct in Surrey, all of that on the south side of, of the James, and then I get the opportunity to ride the ferry across the James to James City County. Uh, they took part of James City County, which obviously has been my base going back to when I was on the Board of Supervisors in the late 80s. Um, and I have part of York County um, on it. Then I get to uh, cross a bridge, the York River, to go over uh, into Gloucester, where I represent Gloucester, then heading back sort of north and, and uh, a little uh, east, uh, pick up uh, King and Queen County and King William County and West Point. Uh, but the real point of it is that I go from the inner city of Hampton, uh, which has the challenges of many major cities uh, in Virginia right now, to a very rural, agrarian, uh, sort of laid back population in King and Queen that has about 6,500 people in the entire county. And the difference in, in their interests are, are, are remarkable. Um, so it, it's been a little challenging. I've tried very hard to get out and, and meet the people. Uh, I remember the first time I went up to King, and, King William County. I went up to a, a function they had where there were going to be a fair number of people, and I thought this would be a great opportunity to meet some of the locals. And I mean, I remember driving back that night and thinking, wow, I'm 80 miles from home, and that's to my home, which is sort of the center of the new district. So there was maybe another 50 miles on the other side. So of it. a lot more windshield time for you. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's amazing, you know, the contemplation that you could have if you just didn't have cell phones. <laughs> that cell phone still works in the car, much to my chagrin. <laughs> I remember the good old days uh, when I first started practicing law as a young attorney. The car was kind of the sanctuary. I have always been a, a litigator and tried cases my entire professional career. And When I was a young lawyer, they dispatched me to courts all over southeastern Virginia. And when I got in the car, it was kind of like a sanctuary because mm -hmm. uh, no one could get to you. And then they came up with this horrible invention called cell phones, and then you became instantly accessible. And I remember when they even had the fax machines that you could put in your car. And so every time I would start driving what had pre previously been sort of a peaceful, reflective period, the fax machine would start whining, the cell phone would start ringing, and... Anyway, it's just a different world. So. Well, it's gotten to the point that uh, now there's some legislation pending, at least with regard to younger drivers and the use of cell phones and texting while driving. Uh, it's pretty remarkable. Uh, probably a decade ago, I became very interested in what we refer to as distracted driving. Uh, and At that point in time, I actually had the, the Department of uh, Motor Vehicles do a study on the use of, of cell phones. This was before really texting uh, uh, arrived and it was amazing uh, the uh, analysis that they did on distracted driving and, and cell phones really was not the number one distracted driving incident at the time. I bet if you went back and, and did it today uh, there'd be a pretty significant change on it. I mean if you drive down Broad Street or Interstate 64 and look to your right or left more often than not, somebody driving that vehicle is going to be on a cell phone or they're going to be looking down in their lap texting away. 
Um, I had actually introduced legislation the past couple of years that would have prohibited texting by young people or adults in driving. It's a, it's a national trend. Uh, my friends in the House of Delegates decided it was an invasion of privacy and some fictitious constitutional right that you had to text and run in the back of me with the stoplight. Um, and uh, Senator Barker's got a bill in uh, uh, dealing with young people in, in texting. Um, and I think it was uh, maybe Virginia Tech that had done a study recently on it. Um, and it's absolutely horrendous. I remember when I was defending the bill on the floor of the Senate last year, somebody asked me, why do you put this bill in? I said, well, let me tell you, it's, it's remarkable the coincidence of life. It was a Monday morning, and I was driving from Williamsburg back to Richmond to the General Assembly. I said, you know, I was coming down Interstate 64 in the right-hand lane, minding my own business, and all of a sudden, uh, this college student, and I knew they were college student because of their age and the sticker they had on the car, ran me off the road. And the, the lady was eating a hot dog with one hand and had a cell phone to her ear with the other one and just lost control of the vehicle and cut over in front of me you know, abruptly. And I had to run off the, the road and she kept on going. I, I don't even think she missed a word in her conversation or got any mustard on her chin from the hot dog. So it's it, called multitasking, huh? Uh, well, that's one term we could use on it. I call it multiple, multiple dangerous signs. Back, uh, back to your district, uh, the, the diversity of your district uh, and the necessity to balance all of those uh, different concerns probably lends itself to uh, doing the same thing as the Senate Majority Leader. Well, it, it does. Uh, I, I think some of it uh, is an organizational challenge. Um, I think a lot of it is I've tried to be very patient up here this year, which is totally uncharacteristic with my personality. Uh, there were a lot of tensions that erupted the first couple of days of the session when the Senate was organizing. My Democratic friends uh, earnestly believed because there was a 2020 division between Republican and Democrats that they were entitled to half of the seats on committees and half of the chairmanships. And uh, I like to think they believed it in earnest. I think it was an absolute public relations uh, fiction that they created to appeal to the Democratic base that they had to put up the good fight. Uh, and, and, I, and I really thought about it a, a great deal. And I thought, well, were I in their shoes, what would I do with, with 20 Republicans if they had a Democratic lieutenant governor? I probably would have done the, the very same thing. So uh, to me, politics is, is business. It is not personal. Maybe that's the attorney side of me. Uh, I can disagree and argue with somebody, and I can disagree and argue vehemently sometimes, but uh, when it's over, it's over, and I don't allow uh, those type of tensions to trespass on my personal relationships with people. But there, there were a lot of tensions, and there's still some bruised feelings uh, ranging from the reorganization uh, there are some Democratic senators that are still very sensitive from a combative campaign season that they felt that they were uh, bruised a little bit um, on reflection. I think they gave as well as they received, but that's not the way a lot of people reflect. I think there were some disappointments by a couple of senators that they were removed, Democratic senators that were removed from committees. I think there was some disappointment uh, by a senator who felt, uh, because of a geographical situation, uh, that he had a birthright to go on one of the committees, uh, and that's just not the way, they, way it works. So I have tried to be uncharacteristically patient. Uh, I've tried to listen to the concerns of my Democratic colleagues. I've tried to make adjustments uh, where we can. Uh, but I have a responsibility as the leader of the Senate Republicans to, to answer to those 19 individuals as well. And that's where it gets a little little challenging. I guess the, <clears throat> the bottom line is e elections have consequences, and uh, you guys have the tie vote through the lieutenant governor. There are a couple of exceptions where he can't vote on matters. What are those? I, I think the lieutenant governor uh, very appropriately and accurately 
basically from a legal standpoint stated his position before the General Assembly ever convened. And, and I really do give Lieutenant Bowling a lot of credit because he didn't wait till we got to Richmond to say this is what I'm going to do. He issued a very thorough and analytical memorandum to all members of the Senate and to the media stating the situations where he felt he could appropriately cast a tie-breaking vote and more importantly listing, the, listing those areas where he would not cast a tie-breaking vote. And the distinction he made is where the Constitution of Virginia specifically referenced a member or a majority of the members of the Senate elected, he indicated that he would not be voting on those. The lieutenant governor is not a member of the Senate, and no one has ever suggested uh, that he is going back to Dine Byer when I was first elected uh, right on through Bill Bowling. He is not a member of the Senate. He's a member of the executive branch, just like the vice president of the United States who provides over, presides over the U.S. Senate is not a member of the Senate. He's a member of the executive branch. But our Constitution does provide some distinctions and where it says a majority of the members elected to the Senate, that very clearly means senators, where the Constitution is silent as to a vote that is required, then the lieutenant governor cl clearly can vote. And this goes back uh, to 1996, where Virginia's preeminent constitutional scholar, A.E. Dick Howard, issued a, like a 43-page memorandum where he exhaustively analyzed it. And this is very consistent uh, with what Dick Howard said. So the lieutenant governor is not going to vote on constitutionally prescribed itch issues, which would be, one, the election of judges, secondly, constitutional amendments, uh, and thirdly, the budget, because all of those provisions in the Constitution say it must be passed by a majority of the members of the Senate elected. So those three areas he will not be voting on. And we've already seen the consequences of it. Uh, we uh, had some uh, elections of judges. Uh, my Democratic friends in the Senate blocked it for a couple of days. Uh, we had some pretty terse exchanges about why they were doing this. It was interesting to me because I asked some questions of one of my Democratic colleagues on the floor. And I said, didn't you all participate in the interview of these judges? Didn't you all vote that they were certified as being qualified to be judges? And why are you blocking them? Uh, basically because we can. Um, and, and I made some pretty firm comments on the floor that I felt that was coming about as a result of some bruised political egos and demonstrating the relevance of 20 Democrats in those critical situations such as the election of judges. Uh, we were able to uh, resolve it after some discussions with the House of Delegates and all the incumbent judges or judges who were seeking reappointment on uh, that day were reelected. Two new judges uh, who were former members of the House of Delegates uh, were not reelected, that the Democrats blocked that even though they found that they were qualified. Um, and I expect that won't be the last occurrence because they want to demonstrate that they can control some situations. But the really critical issue, and not that judges aren't important because they are, the really critical issue and the troublesome issue to me is that the Senate Democrats have been vocally articulating that they are going to resist voting for a budget. And the troubling things to me is this goes back to November, back to, to November when the Senate uh, Finance uh, Committee had their annual Senate Finance Retreat at George Mason the University, and uh, their caucus started talking at that point that in November that we're not going to vote for the budget. And I thought, you know, how soft work is this? Uh, the budget is a critical instrument. It's critical because where we we in Virginia put our money is the enunciation of our policy and our priorities. And we haven't even convened. These people haven't even been sworn in. They say, well, you know, we're going to block the budget and show you. Well, I just that escapes me. And because that's such a critical document that when it's passed, it benefits Republicans, Democrats, independents, uh, 
every race, every gender, every ethnicity, ethnicity that you can think of. I mean, it is a comprehensive document. And, and to hear that, and I am just prayerful, and I mean this very sincerely, I'm just prayerful that we don't get to that situation where we have a Senate budget and the 20 Democrats say we're not going to vote for it. Because if they do that, as sure as you and I are sitting here, Woody, they're going to come with a list of demands in the budget and say we're not going to vote for it unless you do this. Um, and that is a, is a game that I haven't played in 20 years. Well, uh, the uh, majority leader on the House side, Kirk Cox, was here a few weeks ago, and uh, he was, he's, he's, st he's still in hopes that the budget will be done on time, uh, and uh, we certainly hope that that occurs as well. Uh, I'm sure that uh, not having dealt with this kind of situation in the past, you don't want to turn this into what goes on in Washington, D.C., of course. Well, absolutely not, and, uh, and I can assure you that if that type of impasse comes, it, it will not necessarily come out of my mouth, but I assure you that the, that the media is going to start immediately drawing comparisons to the inexcusable gridlock that has taken place in Washington, D.C., which is deplorable, absolutely deplorable. And, and to see that putridness permeate Virginia's legislative processes is very disturbing. But I, I'm like a... Delegate Cox, uh, we have embarked on an unprecedented initiative uh, this year in the General Assembly as it relates to the budget. Uh, uh, there's actually been a schedule of, of meetings and deadlines that have been laid out for the budget conferees that have never been done before. Uh, some of the uh, Senate and House budget conferees are already meeting just to talk informally about issues, trying to identify the real sensitive spots on the budget, seeing whether or not, before we even pass the budget, if there's an opportunity to reconcile some of these these issues. I mean, the dialogue that's going on, the meetings, uh, the formatting that we're attempting to do. We have staffs talking to each other. In 20 years this, that I've been here, this has never happened. And so that's one backdrop. And, and then lurking out there is, in spite of all of these initiatives that we're taking, to make the budget process less contentious, more efficient, and even try to maybe get it passed ahead of the deadline, and then looming over there is this uh, perhaps not supporting it, not because you don't agree with the substance of it, but because you need to demonstrate your political might. It's a little disconcerting, but it's not interrupting the process. We're not stopping the train. And I think part of that timeline includes getting the budget document to all members 48 hours before they have Absolutely. to take a vote on it. I mean, that budget document is pretty formidable. Uh, if you're a slow reader like myself, uh, you know, I probably could get through war and peace quicker than I can the budget document. Uh, but we have had instances literally where there has just been a couple of hours between the time the budget was placed on the desk of the senators and the, legis and the members of the House and when we voted on it. And that's not a healthy thing because uh, no one has really got a complete grasp of, of the overall budget. And what you're doing is you're, you're relying upon those budget conferees to say, hey, it's okay. It's okay. And, and no budget conferee would ever misrepresent anything but it's just because of the intensity of the process and no one individual comprehensively has a grasp of the entire budget uh, because it's segmented. Like I do higher education and public safety. Uh, you know, Senator Stosh may do economic development. Senator Colgan may do, you know, public education. You have individuals that focus on certain aspects of, of the budget, so we each have a very good understanding compartmentalized in specific areas. But is there one person that can stand up and tell you exhaustively what's in that budget? No, the last person who probably could do that was Hunter Andrews. <laughs> and he was a, was a guy of extraordinary intellect, extraordinary intellect. Um, and that's just not the way the process works. So that 48 hours is really important because It'll give every legislator at least the reasonable opportunity to focus in those areas of the budget that she or he may be interested in. We all have areas 
that we're specifically interested in. And this would be an opportunity for them to really go and look at it and, more importantly, ask questions. You know, Absolutely. Tommy, what does this mean? Why did you do this? Uh, that opportunity has not necessarily been afforded the legislators in the past. Speaking of areas of interest, I noted that the governor commended you among others in terms of higher education, especially as that relates to last fall making sure that I think an additional 5,000 in-state uh, students were admitted to our institutions mm -hmm. of higher learning. The governor wants to uh, graduate over the next, what, 10 to 15 years, 100,000 more students in science, technology, engineering, and math, and I know you support that. Well, I've been very involved in the restructuring of higher education in Virginia. Um, I have an interest in it, living in Williamsburg uh, with the College of William & Mary, having a very prominent uh, role in that community. For the last four years, I've actually been teaching at the College of William & Mary. Uh, I happen to think that the opportunity to go to college needs to be universally open to everyone. Uh, the accessibility, along with the affordability, are critical issues. Uh, the governor's embarked on a very ambitious program. He would like 100,000 new degrees to Virginians to be granted in the next 15 years. And so what we have tried to do is to incentivize higher education. We've tried to encourage our public colleges and universities to accept uh, a comfortable uh, level of new students. Uh, we are encouraging uh, all of the public colleges and universities to increase the pool of financial assistance that is available. We have tried to knock down, we haven't tried to, we have knocked down some of the barriers for our students coming out of the community college programs to get into our flagship universities through what we call articulation agreements. We've done a lot of really extraordinary things in Virginia uh, with our exceptional higher education program, but we still have a ways to go and there's some initiatives that the governor has proposed uh, in higher education this year, which remain to be debated on. And of course, uh, financial support, as you indicated, is, is critical, especially when you look at the doubling of tuition rates over the last 10 years. Well, that's, that's, a, that's a debate that uh, engage in, and sometimes I don't necessarily agree with the, the perspective that the administration has on it. I, I understand it, but I've been here long enough. Some people say way too long. But I recall uh, back in the 90s where higher education was cut about 20%. Some people have forgotten that. It was cut 20%, and then on top of that, that freeze was uh, maintained for an additional four years. So what that meant was that higher education went through a four- to six-year period where they had their funding cut and could not raise the tuition and fees to try to make up those cuts. And so what happened was during that period of time where that tuition and fee freeze was on, uh, the electrical bills had to be paid. They continued to increase. Food costs increased. There were capital improvements and deferred maintenance of the colleges that needed to be paid. Uh, your extraordinary faculty were looking for compensation. So while the money maintained a level, the demands in the bills in the drawer got bigger and bigger. They're telling me we're running out of time. So well, we're, you're blessed. We're so pleased to have with you, sir have uh, Senator Tommy Norman, the Majority Leader. Thank you, sir. Thank you for watching Cable Reports. Until next time, I'm Woody Evans. Thanks. Oh, thanks. Mm -hmm.